Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 251, The Church Fathers at Genesis 1 with Craig Allert. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Pretty good. It's chilly up here in the Northwest, chillier than normal. Yeah, well, it is getting close to Christmas time, so... Yeah, uh, how prob- chilly is it in Abilene? Uh, uh, not, not, not too bad. Uh, actually, <laughs> it's raining right now, so... Um, you know, it's probably in the it's in the forties. Oh wow! I didn't think it got that cold. There. Oh yeah, no, no, no. It'll get into the freezing. We'll have sleet and freezing rain. But the problem is, you know, when the rain freezes, the roads get bad. So I mean, oh, we're yeah. not too equipped uh, to, to to clear all the roads. Yeah, I lived in Dallas for a couple of years when that happened, and nobody knows how to drive. And there's you know, there's nothing they can do. And what's it doing up there? Do y'all don't get snow? Do you? We don't. Well, we we've gotten we've gotten three serious snows since I've been here in fourteen years, but it, it's mostly just cold. It feels a little colder than usual. Yeah. So, I just don't ever want to ever want to remember the Midwest cold again. Yeah, that's cold. Yeah. <laughs> so we moved from Wisconsin. I had twelve years in the Midwest with brutal cold, and anything that makes that thought pop into my head again, I just don't like. Yeah, I would like to get a taste of that. Uh, no, you wouldn't. You no. Know? <laughs> Shoveling the snow? No, you wouldn't. I don't know. It's not the snow, man. It's like it's like physically f- feeling the the hairs in your nostrils freeze and break off. That that that's that's what you got. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's a little weird. Yeah, it sound it still sounds fun for some reason. Maybe to visit, <laughs> maybe not to live, but I don't know. But Mike, I want to remind everybody that uh, our voting uh, for our next topic is going to start this Monday, December 17th. So be on the lookout for that poll so you can get your vote in and it's going to run through December 31st. So we got two weeks here to uh, let us know what uh, you want us to cover. Uh, We got three topics coming your way. I'm really, I'm really going to be interested to see where this one goes. So yeah. Well, what are we going to be talking about this week? Well, this week we have uh, Craig Allard with us, um, who's actually geographically pretty close to me. And I didn't, I didn't know that until I looked him up because I, I saw a recent book of his come out and I thought this would be a great topic, uh, sort of an in-between topic and interview for the podcast. But we're going to talk about the church fathers and how they looked at Genesis 1 and how they interpreted you know, you know, some really fundamental creation texts in that first chapter of the Bible. And it's a uh, it's just an interesting discussion. They had a lot of different ideas and some of the same, but uh, Craig's focus is not only going to be that, but sort of how people today use the fathers either well or use them poorly uh, in the way they talk about Genesis 1. So I think it's going to be interesting. Well, I'm really thrilled to have uh, Craig Allert with us. What drew my attention uh, to your work was uh, a recent book that uh, we want to focus on the content of this book today. And I think our listeners, I don't think, I I know our listeners are going to be really interested in this, but we're going to talk about Craig's book, Early Christian Readings of Genesis 1. And the subtitle is Patristic Exegesis and Literal Interpretation. As you well know, Craig, this this is hot button stuff. You know, how how do we look at the opening chapters of Genesis before we get into the book. I'd like you to introduce yourself uh, to our audience. Again, short bio, where you went to school, you know, areas of expertise, you know, where you're teaching, that sort of thing. Sure, no problem. So um, I teach at Trinity Western University in Langley, British Columbia. It's just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, My education is from Multnomah University in Portland, Oregon, is my BA. My MA is from uh, Trinity Western, and then my PhD is from University of Nottingham in, uh, in the UK. So I live in uh, Abbotsford, which is about 20 minutes away from where I work, so total about an hour away from Vancouver. I have a wife of over 25 years, and I have two teenage sons. Actually, one just turned 20, so he's not a teenager anymore. Um, <laughs> my... Uh, areas of interest and expertise, um, they, they range, but uh, I'm a specialist in early Christian theology, uh, particularly um, development of doctrine, uh, historical theology. But I also have a great interest to 
um, communicate that and understand it in some way as prescriptive for um, contemporary evangelicalism. So I'm a bit of a, I don't know if I'm an expert, but I like to dabble in uh, evangelicalism as a, as a movement in, in Canada and the United States. Wow. So what do you, what do you teach? I mean, just give us a few examples of classes that you teach. Sure. So I teach a couple of sections of introduction to, to Christian theology to freshmen every year. Um, and then I teach a number of um, upper level classes. I teach a class on uh, formation of the New Testament canon and uh, the implications for theology of that. I teach a class on church fathers. Um, I teach history of Christianity. Um, and I, I actually also am director of our MA in Biblical Studies here at Trinity Western University, so I have contact with graduate students as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's good. That is that that does range a little bit wider than some professors. Some professors just sort of have a really small box. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're, you're you're a little wider than that, which is nice. <laughs> Well, let, let's get into your book because, again, this is this is hot button stuff. And it, when I saw this come out, it was it was before uh, you know a little bit before uh, ETS and SBL, and it was a book catalog. And I thought, man, this this is going to be a, a great read, a uh, good reference material as well. But I thought, you know, we, we we have to get you on the podcast. So it's been a while trying to get you on. So I'm I'm really like I said, I'm really happy that we were able to get you. But I think that the easiest approach for our audience, and we'll, we'll certainly put a link up on the episode page uh, to your book, uh, and hopefully uh, this will help people see the value in it and uh, you'll, you'll sell some. But what I want to <laughs> do is, <laughs> it's, it's always important because if yeah. you, know, you, do, you do all this work and it's like, please, someone read my work. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, you know, you know the drill. Yeah. But I, I think for what, what we'll do here is the book's divided into two parts. And part one is devoted to understanding the context. So I'm going to just take the first three chapters one by one and ask you to sort of explain what the chapter is about. And I think that will actually, as part one suggests, getting a context, that will give us a context to, to sort of drill down on a few things as we, uh, as we proceed. So yeah. the first chapter is, who are the church fathers and why should I care? <laughs> So answer that question for us. Yeah, I mean, th this really, really was actually the first three chapters, the, the whole part one, understanding the context is is so foundational to what I'm trying to do here in the entire book. Um, but, you know, I, I write um, unabashedly, really, for an evangelical audience. And I really, I really am passionate for evangelicals to understand who the fathers are and why they they are important and too many times you know you 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 hear them just written off or you know thinking they belong people saying that they belong to a dark age or an age that we've rejected as protestants and that sort of thing mm -hmm. but there needs to be a recognition that the church fathers actually are really seminal for for christian orthodox theology uh, I like to call it historical Christian orthodoxy, and that our heritage as Protestant evangelicals does not begin and end really at the Protestant Reformation, mm -hmm. but that we have deep, deep connections and deep roots back to the age of the Church Fathers, the first five centuries of, of Christianity. So really that first chapter is an apologetic. I, I introduce who the church fathers are, um, and then um, why should I care? And I, I talk about those sorts of things. I talk about they help us remember who who we are as Christians. They um, they established kind of the 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 firm essentials of Christianity. They dealt with a lot of these really uh, hot button issues like. You know who was who was Jesus in relation to uh, God the Father, and in relation to the Son, or in relation to the Spirit. So the doctrine of the Trinity is really foundational. Uh, the New Testament that we hold as authoritative was formed in that age. It didn't drop out of the sky. It was formed 
there were limitations made to, to documents that were used in that day and age. And the church fathers were, were um, central in that. And I think, well, I know for myself, when I began to understand that, I started to wonder why I have been ignoring these really seminal figures in my own heritage. And I started to recognize that they actually were part of my heritage, which was a bit contrary to what I was brought up to think. Yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of in the same boat there. Yeah. You know, I, I, without getting too specific, there there is an impulse in certain streams of evangelicalism when they hear church father, they think Catholic dudes, you know, exactly. and I'm a Protestant, so yeah. why pay attention? <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly right. And I think it gets to a, a, a misunderstanding of what the Reformation was about, too. And there's this thinking that, you know, at the Protestant Reformation, you know, we rejected those Catholic dudes. Mm -hmm. But in fact, Luther, Calvin, um, actually wanted to maintain those really close connections to our own heritage so that we can actually claim them as part of our own heritage. Well, that I mean that that's good. When when you were talking just a few moments ago, you know about about canon and then the church fathers. For me, I mean, I do. I'm a Semitist. You know, I'm a Hebrew yeah. Semitic guy, but I I do a lot with Second Temple stuff. And then one one of the discussions I get drawn into a lot is you know should should we consider you know First Enoch canonical? Right. And and I really I read Vanderkam's pretty lengthy and detailed essay on this in one in his book on apocalyptic Christianity it was co-edited with uh, I can't remember who the other guy was uh, Adler but one of the more interesting things to me was reading I believe it was Tertullian it was either Tertullian or, or Irenaeus mm -hmm. basically saying look you know you all know that I fought for this book out there and I'm getting kind of old and you know I've kind of noticed that I'm a lone voice <laughs> out here. And, and he was willing that the part that, that struck me the first time I saw the, these excerpts was he was, he assumed that the spirit of God had moved and created what was behind the consensus against his own wishes. Mm -hmm. And he was fine with it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, that it was really instructive uh, to me. And, and so I, I know the church fathers go beyond, you know, just just being an example. And my own suspicion is that as our culture moves through this, through its post Christian uh, milieu into, in, in some cases, even an anti Christian milieu, that, 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 that we're actually moving sort of forward into the past. You know, we're, we're seeing a paganization. Uh, of the culture, and and that's exactly what the church fathers, a lot of them, just had to deal with. Yeah, I think you're right. Them. So I think yeah. I think they're going to become even more important for the kinds of debates that they had to have. That that they'll become points of reference. But again, that's just my guess. It's not my field, but it's I just that sort of hunch that I have. Well, that's really interesting because years ago, uh, Robert Weber. Uh, I think it was 1999, wrote that book called Ancient Future Faith. And then okay. it, spurred, it spurred on a whole kind of ancient future series. Um, and what he argues in that Ancient Future Faith book is that the shift from a, a, a modernity to a postmodernity or modernism to a postmodernism is basically opening the door for us to, to appreciate the church fathers much more because um, the culture today, uh, the postmodern culture, would be much more receptive to um, to the way they thought, and also exactly what you said. It, they kind of are examples to us of how to work in that kind of context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot of what floats my boat is is trying to get people to trying to get modern believers to take more seriously the, the supernatural worldview of the biblical writers. And, and these guys that we're talking about now are, are, are the closest we, thing we have yeah. you know, to, to the biblical period. And they, you know, they imbibe, you know, heavily, you know, in that. So, yeah, I, again, I, I've just, I've been, I haven't read that, that book, uh, ancient future faith, but uh, as we're sitting here, I've, I've made a note to myself to get it, <laughs> but that, 
that sounds like a lot of the things I've been sort of pondering, but I, I, I mean, I could get lost in that subject. So I'll, I'm going to try to steer myself back here to, <laughs> uh, to Genesis. But that, I mean, that's important because, you know, when they do comment on Genesis, it, it's not just sort of, hey, we don't have anything better to do. Let's talk about Genesis. I mean, they are responding to things they need to respond to. Yeah. And they're, and they're handling the text. And they, they felt free to handle the text in, in such a way that, that, they could respond, yeah. uh, you know, to certain things. So that chapter two, you know, after you, you talk about why we should care about the church fathers and, and yep, we should. Chapter two is how not to read the fathers. And the <laughs> subtitle there is a survey of creation science appropriation of the fathers. Okay. So this, that just has loaded, that has, that's a loaded chapter. It so what is. do you mean by appropriation? <laughs> Tell us what you mean by the appropriation, and then give us some examples. Sure. So the, I, I need to give you a little bit of background on, on how this book came to be. So a number of years ago, I applied for a grant from Biologos Templeton called the Evolution and Christian Faith Program. Um, I received the grant, which allowed me, thankfully, to buy out some admin, administrative duties and some courses, uh, which, of course, as you know, uh, gives you much more time to study and write. Yep. So what I proposed in that uh, grant application was to do a book, you know, and, and we have the, the product of that now. But um, I, I looked at how... Uh, organizations like Answers in Genesis, uh, Creation Ministries International, uh, Institute for Creation Research, uh, those predominantly those three. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I looked at how they were using the church fathers. And they, you know, as you can well imagine, um, there's not a, a huge body of literature of them doing that. Mm -hmm. But there are some some pretty key chapters and books and articles that are, that appear on their website. And I was I was struck and in the book I even say I, I was sometimes even appalled at the way the church fathers were being hijacked to speak for creation science. Um, so that's that's really the foundation of this chapter. So what I do is I take many of of the examples of these um, these articles and these uh, chapters and how, how they use the fathers. And I kind of uncover and show why that's not the way the fathers should be read or used. So how not to, how not, how not to read the fathers? Well, here's some examples and here's why you shouldn't read them that way. So w was it an issue of taking the fathers out of context or or imposing a context or forcing them, taking their words to answer questions that they weren't asking? I mean, how, how do you characterize that? Yeah, I would say all of the above, actually. I, I think you can kind of start from a, a, a big picture where they, they paint the, the context of biblical interpretation in the age of the fathers rather simplistically. In a kind, and, and this gets to the, the third chapter as well, but they paint it rather simplistically as a kind of the literalists against the allegorists. Mm -hmm. And that is that that is much too simplistic. Um, you know, they assume that when literal or according to the letter or expressions like that are used in the church fathers, that they mean exactly the same things as we do today. So literal, literal to us means in accord with history, right? That, you know, behind the text, there's an actual history that happened. But that's not the way the fathers understood it. So um, there's that big kind of context. But then there are examples where there's selectivity. So you pick and choose and you proof text mm -hmm. uh, where, where context is completely ignored. And it, you know, all you really have to do is look at, look closer at the context of any given text that they're citing, and you can quite clearly see that they're being used in a way that they probably should, well, not probably, they shouldn't be used. Um, 
there is examples of a flat out misunderstanding what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So there, I, I take examples of all those kinds of things. Um, and I took, you know, uh, most of the ones I saw, there are a few that I, I, I didn't cover, but I think there, there's a pretty good representation of what's happening out there in those appropriations of the fathers. And I conclude that, you know, you, you really can't appropriate the fathers for the creation science, creation science way of interpreting Genesis one. Yeah, we'll get we'll get we'll drill down into a few specifics uh, in, in a few minutes. But um, before I before we move on to chapter three, were you is this a problem only with young Earth creationist groups or or old Earth creationist groups? Are they doing the same thing with the fathers? I know that the organizations you mentioned, I think, are all in the young Earth camp. So I, I don't know if, if you looked at old Earth or not, or, or maybe one of them was old Earth. Yeah, I did. I didn't really look at at old Earth. Uh, they were all, I think you're right, young Earth. I I talk very briefly um, about uh, the um, intelligent design kind of camp. Uh, especially, oh, I can't remember, Hugh Ross. And he, he seems a little bit more aware yeah, he, of, pardon he'd me? Be old Earth. He'd be old, you know, an old yeah. Earth. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't deal specifically with him. He, he seems to know a little bit more of the subtleties. Um, but as I said, I, I did not dig very deep into old Earth. It was, it was predominantly the three that I mentioned. All right. The, the third chapter is what does literal mean? And then the subtitle is patristic exegesis in context. So if you walked up to a church father, maybe you could zero in on one in particular and, and, and asked him the question, hey, do you interpret the Bible literally? <laughs> uh, what kind of answer would you get and, and what would they mean by it? Uh, they would say yes, or he would say, yes, I do. Um, and I hope uh, that would spur on a conversation of, well, what do you mean by literal? Mm -hmm. So you cannot draw a straight line from what we mean by literal today, kind of in our post-enlightenment sensibilities, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, you can't draw a straight line from what we mean when we say literal to what the fathers meant by literal. So what I try to do there is, is go from that, that big misunderstanding of uh, I, I call it a false um, a false misunder a false paradigm, right? Where there's uh, in the early church there's a group of literalists and a group of allegorists, and they were constantly battling each other for what the proper way to interpret the Bible was, and that's really not the way it was. Um, you may have heard of a group called the uh, Antiochians and a group called the Alexandrians. Mm -hmm. And and often what, what happens in these creation science appropriations is that the Antiochians are labeled as literalists and the Alexandrians are labeled as allegorists. Sure. Antiochians are said to kind of be the forebears of our own way of interpreting what they would call grammatical historical or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the and the allegorists resorted to all these wild interpretations and made the text say whatever they wanted it to say. Right. And that's a that's a false false paradigm. That that's not the way it was. The, yeah, the fact, on, on both sides of it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, the fact is that both the Antiochians and the Alexandrians looked for figural readings. They were concerned with a, a higher reading of the text. The difference was really in how they thought they could get that higher reading. And that was the real difference. So what I try to do is show some of those subtleties. I show how the Antiochians were anchored in uh, the rhetorical tradition, while the Alexandrians were anchored more in the philosophical tradition. And, um, and how those come together, even in a father like Basil of Caesarea, who I discuss uh, quite significantly, actually, in, in the book. 
And that context is is really, really foundational. I consider actually chapter three really the most important chapter in the book. Uh, it, it's 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 based in that that idea that in if you want to understand what the fathers are trying to do with Genesis one or any other biblical text for that matter, you need to understand what they think the Bible is doing and how they read it. And if we assume that they're reading the Bible the same way we are, we are off on the right, wrong foot right from the get-go, and we will not understand what the fathers are trying to do. So the, the, the two sides were, what, what did, how did you put it again, textual versus philosophical, like, like how to get there, how to get uh, for figural yeah, readings? The rhetorical tradition oh, okay. and philosophical tradition. Okay. So, and that's... The, it, that, that's where actually a lot of the terms arose. So when you see terms like according to the letter mm -hmm. or um, the common understanding or historia, history, um, or according to the words, things like that, those are all anchored in the rhetorical tradition. And the Antiochians cared about what the text said. The Alexandrians also cared about what the text said. Their concern was not with what was behind the text, not the events behind the text, but the text itself was revelation. And that's where they, they that's where the, if you want to say battleground was, I'm not sure that's the best word, but th that's what the issue was. Hmm. How would they, in terms of, I'm, I'm going to ask you a, a a two-sided question here yeah and and i i'm a i mean i'm a text guy but don't assume that um i'm not laying a trap here for you. <laughs> uh, because i i think the way we teach exegesis now ought to be different i'll mm. just I'll, I'll put it in the most general terms i can but um procedurally what would an antiochene do with the text what is, what is he looking for? And Antiochene is looking for indications in the text to draw him to a higher reading. But that higher reading needs to be anchored in the text. Okay. And the problem that they had with the Alexandrians, who was also looking for a higher reading in the text, was that the Alexandrian readings, the higher readings, ceased to be connected to the text. Mm -hmm. So the, the Antiochians wanted to say things that were in some way, in their mind, tethered to the text somewhere. Right, but the other the you know, the the Alexandrians more or less viewed the text as a launching point, you know, a launching pad or something like that. Yeah, yeah, as a as a um a code to be cracked is okay. is the way um I think it's uh R. R. Reno puts it and and O'Keefe and Reno put it in their book, a, a code to be cracked. So would, so, would you sorry, use the ahead. word esoteric? Were, were they part um, of esotericism? No, I, I think esoteric is, is too loaded. Okay. Um, and and, and esoteric to me um, brings up this picture of really not not being guided by anything. Like one common misunderstanding I think of the Alexandrians is that they just went off on these wild speculations and these wild interpretations. But they were guided by a narrative. They were guided by what um, one scholar calls uh, the architecture of the text. So they were reading the text through a certain lens. And allegory needed to be connected to that lens, needed to be connected to that story in order to, in order for higher readings to function the way they're meant to function. Hmm. All right. So, what, well, I, I want to hold off till we actually get into some of the the specific issues, but I think that's, that's probably sufficient, you know, that 
again, the, the points that you're making, just you know, to summarize for the audience, is that both of these approaches have a sensitivity to the text. Okay, that one's one's not like leaving it behind and saying, "Boy, we we finally got out of that straight jacket called the text." Right. right. Like like we don't we don't even want to think about that now. Thanks for what you did for me, but I'm out of here. You know. So that is typically the way you know an, an allegorist or allegorical method is caricatured. Um, yeah. Just let me. At what point and how fast can I get rid of the text to start saying stuff I want to say? Yeah. Um, and that that goes you know much too far. So I think that's that's helpful. And it's probably a value judgment to look at both sides and and say, well, this one cared, you know, quote unquote, cared more about the tax. That's that's probably an unfair way to to frame the question as well. I mean, they both care about it, but in different ways, and you know, for for different reasons, maybe or something like that. I like I like the lens, uh, you know, metaphor that you just used, hmm. uh, or the filter. I mean, that I think we'll come back to that as we proceed, but. Um, Let's get into some some specifics, because in part two, you know, which you have uh, labeled as reading the fathers, uh, I want to I want to focus. I mean, we, we might go elsewhere, but I, I want to make sure that I hit chapter five, and that is the creation out of nothing, okay, the mm-hmm. ex nihilo discussion. So, did any of the church fathers argue for creation ex nihilo again out of nothing in Genesis one? Because I, I can imagine that there's some of them said something that the the you know creationist schools or, or groups um, that you you mentioned you know your your work was about how they appropriate certain things that the fathers say. There's got to be something that they latch onto and say, look, you know. This guy was talking about Genesis creation just like we are. So what what's the useful fodder when it comes to the whole ex nihilo thing? Or do none of the church fathers take that perspective? I mean, which is it? It's an interesting issue because um the church fathers would agree, or let me let me correct that statement. There are are some church fathers who would agree with the claim of some Old Testament scholars that Genesis 1 does not teach creation out of nothing. So you've got um, men like Justin Martyr in the middle of the second century who actually says quite explicitly that he agrees with Plato that that creation was from already existing matter. But there was a shift round about uh, Theophilus of Antioch. So about 20 years after Justin, there was a shift, and every church father after Theophilus of Antioch would believe in creation ex nihilo. Um, I, I, wow, what, what caused that? Well, the shift was was caused by the need to to um, assert that theologically. Okay. So you've got, I mean, you've got an int- really interesting situation here, right? For for a Christianity today, evangelicalism that says, you know, we get our doctrine from the Bible and the Bible alone, right? And here's the church fathers, basically showing us that, you know, there may be theological necessities that warrant a certain doctrine that is not necessarily explicit in Scripture. Right. It's, it's, it's a possibility elevated to a, a place to land based on specific, a specific set of circumstances. Right, right. And, which has since now become, well, pretty much... Christian orthodoxy, hasn't it? Creation ex nihilo. Yeah, I mean, you c- certainly if you're in the uh, in the young earth, even if you're in the old earth, but it's it's going to be it's going to be tethered to um, Big Bang cosmology. Yeah, but you know, it, it's it's still it's a different way. The Big Bang, the old earth, you know, view is a different way to have the same discussion, essentially. Right. Wow. So what what was what were they? taking a stand against 
Well, it, it, it's instructive to look at uh, Theo Theophilus of, of Antioch. Um, and so this is the first guy, really, that we have an explicit argument for creation out of nothing. And uh, he, he's finding that um, there are certain philosophies and cosmologies in those philosophies that are, are making the claim that since matter exists and God exists, that God is not above matter. I mean, put quite simply. So the need comes, the theological need arises that for, for God to be sovereign over all, for God to be Lord over all, he has to be able to create the matter that he shapes. Yeah, you have and, to have a dualistic approach. Right, right. So it, 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 is, it is explicitly a, a, um, an issue with, with the, the, the uh, philosophies, the theologies, if you want, that they were dealing with. And you can see this in Theophilus of Antioch. You can see it in um, Augustine and his, his dealings with the Manichaeans, right? It's, it's the same kind of thing where creation out of nothing becomes a really foundational doctrine to uh, prove, if you will, the sovereignty of the Christian God. Would, would earlier church fathers, though, they wouldn't be, or would they, would, would they be monists? In other, in other words, would, would they make the same linkage between God and creation that Theophilus was trying to address, or, or would they just do something different? Yeah, I think they had different concerns. Um, you know, if you compare Theophilus about 170 with Justin Martyr about 150, they had different concerns. And, and, and Justin Martyr was really concerned with his very survival. So he was, he was concerned to make an apologetic for, for um, the benefit that, that Christianity had for the empire. And those really weren't the concerns of a Theophilus of Antioch 20 years later. Right. So I think, I think you can just chalk that up to uh, the different concerns they had. You've got, in, in, as, as time moves on, you've got a development of theology as well. You've got the development of the Trinity um, in those first several, several centuries. You know, you even got you've got Justin Martyr not really knowing what to do with, with the Son, with Jesus Christ, calling him a second God. But, you know, 20 years, 30 years later in Irenaeus, you have a much, much clearer understanding of the relationship of the Son to the Father. And that, that's what we call the development of the doctrine of the Trinity that culminates really at Nicaea in 325 and Constantinople in 381. Yeah, we, th I mean, this is important because we often we often forget that what they're struggling with the text. Right. Okay, okay we, we got this thing sitting in front of us that makes certain statements. What do we do with that? Like, how do we understand that? So we, again, again the, the caricature uh, among some, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to make the, a sweeping generalization here, but there's this caricature that the when the church fathers write stuff, they're just like dispensing with scripture at some point and making stuff up. You know, and okay, maybe some somebody did that at some point. Typically what they're doing is they're struggling with the text. And then they get, as they live their lives, they get confronted with problems, with questions, with issues. Um, and then they, I mean, they're, they're the smart guys in the room. So they're the ones that are supposed to answer these questions. And they, chances are they have greater access to, you know, more material or you know, even a Bible, you know, because not everybody has a Bible. That's right. Uh, you know, that, that sort of thing. So, you know, they're, they're not just freewheeling and freestyling. They're, they're struggling with the data that emerged from the text, not only how to understand it, but even how to articulate it, you know, how to yeah. articulate the understandings that they're, they're, they're coming to. And, and to me, the other thing we forget is that, Beyond maybe a copy of the Bible, it's not like they can go to a bookstore or a library or, you know, a journal database and say, well, you know, let, let's see what scholarship has said about that, you know, <laughs> to help me think. I mean, they, they don't have a lot of access to a lot of material. And so it's entirely conceivable that they're locked on to one or two problems 
And they never even encounter certain questions that 20, 30, 100 years later, a lot of church fathers are thinking about. They may, they may never have addressed it at all. It may never have come up. Yeah, yeah. You know, but, think, we, but we forget that. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think the way you put it, struggle with the text. I mean, we, we assume, and I'll, I'll, I'll just point the finger at me. I, I, I will always remember um, the realization I made that, you know what? Not, the church fathers did not approach the text with the same history of theology that we have in, our, in the 20th and 21st century. With, with things that have been battled out, with things that have been developed, they were honestly trying to figure out who Jesus was. They were trying to figure out who he was um, in relation to Jesus, or pardon me, in relation to the Father. So statements like, uh, you know, I and the Father are one. You know, what does that mean? You know, what does it mean? What doesn't it mean? You know, exactly. What, what are the gradations of that? Yeah. That's right. And, and many other verses like that. You know, in, in the midst of that, also interpreting the Old Testament Christologically. In, in order to, to in, in, Christianity never rejected the Jewish scriptures. They never rejected the Old Testament, as we call it. Um, there, there was a group that wanted to, but they were, you know, Marcion was, was soundly put in his place, I guess you could say. But, you know, trying to read certain passages like Proverbs 8, um, Christologically, sure. they read it as about Christ. But at the same time, they're trying to figure out what the New Testament is saying about this Christ that they're actually worshiping in their churches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and for those, those listening, if you don't think this happens today, spend an hour on the Internet <laughs> okay, mm. and, and Google things like, you know, Google some of these verses and these phrases, or, you know, what the meaning of, and then fill, you know, fill in something like, you know, I and the Father are one. And, you know, you're going to have a lot of people just say stuff that, you know, you look at and you go, oh, well, that's worth thinking about. And then you're going to have a lot that, boy, that's just crazy town. You know, <laughs> and, and so there, the, the, that situation that we have, again, this this whole, you know, thing with, you know, with the internet and YouTube and all that sort of stuff, that's happening. I mean, the, the, in, in the Church Father's Day, that they're, they're running into those kinds of ideas. Certainly not the proliferation of them, right? But 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 they're running into things that they have to think about. Well, is that a dumb idea or is that a good idea? Is that is that within the realm of plausibility here? You know, they they have to come up with some some way to understand and articulate and either affirm or eliminate you know, or, or sort of just leave on the table some idea. And they're expected to do that for the community. Especially, so there's, there's a lot of pressure there. You're right, especially when, when certain interpretations are coming from within the church itself, yeah. when, they're, when they're coming from a deacon or a priest or a presbyter or even a bishop. When, when the very you know, tradition of the church, the very life of the church is at stake here if you don't deal with the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it, it's a little bit of the same, but, you know, the, the stakes were higher. Mm -hmm. And you're right, they they don't have any of the framework. I mean, a lot of these guys are saying stuff and they don't know that they've stepped in it because they don't have any framework. Exactly. You know, to tell them when they've stepped in it, you know, it it's not, you know, they just, they don't have the body of, of discussion. That's exactly right. As, as I tell a lot of my students, you, you take, for example, Arius, the, the fourth century uh, priest who essentially argued that Jesus was a created being mm -hmm. created by the father. When he offered that, he did not think he was offering heresy, and and he wasn't automatically accused of heresy. He offered it. There was some disagreements, and ultimately a council was called so they could get together and say, you know, what do we think about what this guy Arius is offering? Is this what we believe the Bible to be teaching, or we believe the Bible to be teaching something else? 
Yeah, there, there. He didn't have a precursor that, like I said, stepped in it before him. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, he That's was right. the guinea pig. Well, what about uh, in, another, in another chapter? You talk about the days of Genesis. Mm. So what there, there had to be a, a variance of opinion on how to understand the days. So give us some examples of what the the fathers were thinking and saying. Yeah, well, there there certainly were some fathers who would have said, you know, they're, they're 24-hour days. Um, but there are also fathers like Basil and more, I guess, most famously Augustine, who, who like to talk about days in, in terms of, of a figure. So um, Basil, for example, would talk about the eighth day. And he um, he connected it to the liturgy of the church, where the eighth day was celebrated, and he used that to move into the eternity of God. So the days, you know, anchoring it in in these historical, literal twenty four hour days, really faded in the distance in in Basil's understanding. And Augustine even even made the famous statement, you know, I'm paraphrasing, of course, here, but, you know, anybody who believes they're literal is kind of, kind of crazy. <laughs> so, so, so there was a, a, a variety of meanings, which, which tells me that, that you know, the, the fathers that held to the 24-hour kind of literal day um, were functioning quite well along with the fathers who disagreed you don't you don't see a, a a body of literature where they're where they're disagreeing on that issue and it's because they they were reading the text for a different reason mm -hmm. and the guys that did hold to a 24 hour view for example Ephraim Ephraim the Syrian uh the guys that did a uh, agree with this 24 hour view it was just kind of a yeah it's 24 hours now let's get on to something that matters kind of attitude so they 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 weren't reading the text of genesis to find these you know as scientific clues to the way the world was created or when it was created there was something deeper that they wanted and they hold that in common hmm. well that would be nice if we if we approach that that way now i mean there, there, yeah there's no a couple of years ago there was sort of a big i don't know mudslinging is pejorative but there was a sort of a a showdown a planned showdown at uh, ets you know where you had the old earthers the biologos people and the young earthers in the same room and everybody got to cast stones you know and, oh, yeah. and uh, I, I talked to one of the guys uh, afterwards who was you know sort of what with well, he was with the, the biologos position and basically it, it turned out that well at, at some point everybody just threw stones at me you know? so, <laughs> it was a, it was a common target there <laughs> but yeah i mean it this has and there are lots of reasons for this that this discussion has sort of been elevated to the to this perceived status of importance that you know, it, it gets today yeah. uh, in, in contrast, you know, to what you just described. Yeah. Uh, hey, you know, what, whatever, let's just move on to something more significant here. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, I should say that, you know, in the book, my intent is not to prove that the genus, the, the church fathers were evolutionists that that's not at all what i'm trying to do i think that's right. that would be that's, impossible exactly they're, they're, not, and, they're not speaking the language of darwin who is exactly in the 19th century and it's just as futile to prove that they were creationists you know in the sense that that you know answers in genesis or something would intend that's not my intent my intent nor is my intent to say you know what we need to get back to the way the fathers interpreted the bible I think I think the book should lead to that very very important conversation, but the intent of the book is not to argue that. Mm -hmm. The intent but, of the book is is simply to say, look, they approached the Bible differently than we did. Why did they do that? And perhaps 
we can in some way see that as prescriptive. Perhaps we can learn something from them. Well, that that's actually a good a good note, you know, to wrap up on because if that's what you'd like to see as the takeaway, again, mm. that, that that that's a good way to, you know, to sort of fade out here. Um, and that to me that that would be a good takeaway because you know I, I think most of the people who you know have followed this podcast over the years, you know, they they're they're kind of with me on this, but my my sort of facetious line is. You know, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna land anywhere specific on you know the views of creation or you know views of eschatology. I'll, I'll let other ministries fight each other about that because <laughs> you know, there are <laughs> ministries that essentially exist to fight with somebody else. You know. No, you're right. Yeah. And and you know, I may learn something important. You know, by sort of leaning in on that debate or that conversation at, at some point, and that that's fine. But there's there's other people doing that. And yeah. I would rather, you know, sort of gravitate toward, you know, again, this is my own assessment, but more important things. And, and believe it or not, you know, that, that's not just the church fathers, but it, it's it's been all, you know, Christian thinkers and frankly, just, you know, Christians you know, collectively over the ages, they have made a distinction between things that they view as essential and other things that are just less essential or non-essential. Exactly. And, you know, it, it would be nice if we could sort of get our focus back to the things that Basically, there's very little disagreement on that are essential, and then be thinking, you know, back to Weber's book, you know, about how do we, how do we detect those things and, you know, sort of build up strength on those things in a postmodern and a post-Christian culture. I mean, that yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, it it, it would be nice to start with what we agree on, mm-hmm. and understand that. As you say, some things matter more than others, and some things matter less. Let's be clear on what matters and what matters less. Yeah, if the church, you know, shifts at some point into into the status of sort of being monitored or persecuted in the West, you know, the the reality is that you're going to be thrilled to to bump into an evolutionary creationist someday if you're a young Earther, because you're going to see that they're actually your ally. You know, yeah. When you're in difficult circumstances. So yeah. if you can see it there, you know, why can't you see it now? Yeah. You know, just things like that. So th- thanks for being with us and talking yeah. about your book. And again, I, I this is recommended reading uh, to my audience. Again, it's it's just good to know that, you know, there's a variance of opinion uh, even back, you know, in the day, back in the days of the church fathers, really formative periods. And we don't want, again, to you know, on, on our podcast, we focus on primary sources. And if you're going to be quoting the church fathers to defend this or that view, okay, for, for them, that becomes a primary source. So don't abuse it. Right. You know, that, that's important to, to treat yeah. your sources, you know, the way they need to be treated. Well said. Thanks for, thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks very much. Appreciated it. All right, Mike, another good one. That was interesting. Uh, just keeps getting better and better. I don't think we have one bad episode, to be honest with you, Mike. <laughs> I might well, be a little biased. Maybe, maybe there, there's another poll, another, another thing to vote <laughs> on, which was a bad episode. Uh, let's not do that. Yeah, uh, no, but, but uh, uh, you know, talking to these scholars, these types of episodes really resonate with our listeners. Yeah, I, I think it's a valuable lesson, even if we disagree with somebody, in this case, you know, the church fathers just to appreciate their effort, you know, because the, they're, they're struggling to understand scripture like we are. And they, you know, they had different reasons, different pressures on them. You know, it's just, they had resources or not. Many of them didn't have resources, a, a totally different framework, but they, you know, they, they devoted their lives, you know, to this sort of thing. So that at the very least, you know, we can sort of appreciate the struggle uh, that they were having. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I appreciate Dr. Allert's work so much, because, uh, you know, I'm not going to take time to go back and study church history, you know, unless you go to mm-hmm. Bible college or something, it's just not going to happen. So yeah, um, that's why I, this podcast, I think, is so valuable that we could aggregate some of those. Um, yeah, do all that work ourselves, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, this, I'm the same way. I mean, I'm not going to go go out and do degree level, you know, work in, in, in church history. But I mean, there there are things that I sort of key on. And it's nice to know, well, who's done work in that? And if they'll come on the podcast and talk about that stuff, you know, that 
that's definitely worth doing. I, I do want to sprinkle in, you know, some some church historical stuff into the podcast when it relates to again helping us think about the text. So this is a good one for that. All right, Mike. Well, next week we're going to do Day of the Lord. Yeah, Day of the Lord. So, you know, this is an important topic. Uh, it might sound sort of like a a boring run of the mill. You know, what what is there really to think about? You know, sort of topic, but. Trust me, uh, there's a lot to think about here. It has a lot of uh, ramifications. All right, Mike. Well, we appreciate Dr. Allert coming on and uh, want to thank everybody else for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.